Uh, I think we've got a few people in the hall, but we'll let them trickle in. Uh, I'm going to uh, welcome you with great pleasure. My name is Sten Vermund. Uh, I am the uh, director of the Institute for Global Health here at Vanderbilt. Uh, as you know, uh, last year was our first annual or first ever uh, Global Health Forum. We started to call it the Middle Tennessee uh, Global Health Forum, but then we had people coming from all over the state, and we had some T uh, Kentucky folks, and we had some Boston folks, and so we're just calling it the Tennessee Global Health Forum. Uh, we are um, pleased with last year's forum in the sense that it helped people get to know each other, and uh, it helped people appreciate that there may be synergies in their overseas activities in which if they uh, know each other and work together, they may get more, more substantive work done than if they're working more or less in isolation. Um, we've heard a few vignettes of uh, favorable uh, follow-up from last year's forum, and um, most importantly, your evaluation of last year's forum overwhelmingly suggested that we do it again, which of course was, and we did get some critical feedback. Uh, the venue had some lighting problems, and. You know, there were, there, were, there were a variety of things that we've tried to correct with this year's venue here at the university. Of course, we traded, uh, we traded uh, good lighting for bad parking. But anyway, uh, we, we appreciate those of you who took the trouble to take our little shuttle. And uh, I was impressed with uh, Olivia and her team uh, providing coffee over the parking deck over there. I thought that was a, that was a touch that uh, deserved credit. But uh, we are... Um, uh, also grateful to the Forum Planning Committee, uh, and I won't read the names, but you can see them on the screen. A nice swath of uh, Vanderbilt uh, staff, uh, um, folks from um, a number of non-governmental organizations. You'll hear NGO term all day long, and that's what we're talking about. CBO, community-based organizations. So if you hear NGO and CBO, you know what we're talking about. And uh, we also uh, have, I think, some nice uh, representation from the community, including uh, people like Susan, who are on our um, advisory board. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge the speakers. Uh, the speakers, come, again, I won't read them, but uh, come from a wide swath of backgrounds, everything from uh, medicine and nursing, which you might expect if you come to uh, uh, Vanderbilt Medical Center, to uh, water and sanitation expertise, management expertise, and any of you who work overseas know that management is front and center in terms of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, we've got an, an award-winning architect who, who's, who's extraordinary uh, visitation hospital uh, uh, suffered minuscule damage during the quake uh, in Haiti. Uh, we have uh, Avi Herskovitz, who will be introduced separately, uh, who's come all the way from the West Coast. Uh, we have folks who are experts in, in farming, like the uh, Ferrises, um, uh, public health screening. Uh, we have people from faith-based uh, orientations. Uh, there's probably an atheist in the, in, the, in the list there somewhere. I mean, we're really, really diverse, you know. Uh, and we have, uh, we have uh, I'm an academic. I'm supposed to be balanced. I'm not supposed to. But in any case, I think we've got uh, uh, tremendous expertise, anthropology, uh, nursing, and, and, and I'm, I'm real pleased. Sometimes we've just got folks who are, who are, who are, who are activists and mobilizers who uh, saw wrong and tried to right it, as, as President Kenny might have said. Uh, we, uh, have, uh, we want to put in at least a plug for the uh, Institute for Global Health. This was crafted uh, by Vanderbilt leadership in 2005. Uh, it's not that it was the first time global health was going on at Vanderbilt. Quite the contrary, there was a vibrant uh, pool of faculty who were deeply engaged in global health issues. Uh, um, uh, Shanghai, uh, China, Guatemala, um, uh, a number of countries around the world where Vanderbilt faculty were, were very involved. But it, this did create a certain organizational um, coherence to communication within the medical center and later on in the entire university around uh, global health activities. And I, I do think that uh, our mission to provide leadership uh, in uh, the uh, classic academic triad of uh, education, research, and service, uh, that we are making progress in that regard because we are very pleased when we can help somebody else do something. We don't have to do it ourselves. We don't have to take credit for it. But if we can take our experience overseas and make it possible for 
somebody at Vanderbilt, or for that matter, somebody in Middle Tennessee, to do something important, we are very pleased to do so. And our vision is the same as your vision, the improved health and well-being of people in local and global environments. And you'll notice that uh, we say health and well-being because we think there is an inter integral link between health and development. We can do all the health care in the world, but without that development platform, it's unlikely to be sustainable. I can tell you story after story after story where um, the health contributions have been effective but transient because the backbone uh, development agenda has been neglected. Uh, that could be said the same for uh, medical care, which is exclusively curative without keeping in mind the, the, the platform of, of water, sanitation, uh, uh, education. Uh, again, the sustainability of that purely curative model is, is going to be limited. So we, uh, that will explain to you why this audience is as diverse as it is and why we've uh, defined health uh, as broadly as we can. Um, we don't have time to go through this. I just want to impress you with a slide. I don't think any of my slides were impressive yet, so I wanted this one to, you know, sort of go, wow. So we do have a lot going on, and I actually have four slides like this uh, where, you know, I can just keep going with country after country. But these are some of the larger, uh, more um, uh, noticeable Vanderbilt-linked initiatives. I've thrown in a few of you in here. If you've, if you've ever called me, I've taken credit for what you do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, Fran, are you in the audience? But uh, we, we have, uh, we have um, a lot of pride in our partnerships and uh, are very keen to grow those partnerships. So there's a lot going on and a lot more if we were to represent the people in this room. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, uh, our uh, dean uh, and our vice chancellor for health sciences, uh, so uh, the vice chancellor is responsible for the entire medical center and its activities, is the boss of the deans, but is also the dean of the medical school, uh, Jeff Balzer. He is an anesthesiologist, a distinguished uh, laboratory scientist, but somebody who, although his uh, re research is more on the basic science side of the equation and ours tends to be more on the applied side, he's been an enormous supporter of what we do. He's been... Uh, rock solid in trying to nurture the global health activities at the institution that focus on, on uh, developing countries. So without further ado, Jeff. Thank you, Stan. On behalf of Vanderbilt University, um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second annual Tennessee Global Health Forum hosted by the Institute for Global Health. The Institute um, was formed in 2005, doesn't seem like very long ago, and as part of the School of Medicine. And one of the reasons I'm introducing the forum on behalf of Vanderbilt University is because the, the Institute is no longer an entity of the School of Medicine. It has recently been um, given university-wide status and really reflects and supports and engages and puts a house around all of the global health activities going on in all 12 schools of the university. I think that um, really cements um, the status of global health on this campus and really recognizes the interdisciplinary approach to global health that we not only um, have been taking but must take, um, involving um, not just medicine and obviously nursing, but ethics and law and public policy and all of the things that a great university can bring to the table in engaging glo global health. Um, speaking of a great university, um, we have something that we call the Discovery Science Video that we've been using to really educate the public on what Vanderbilt does in Discovery Science. And there are three sections of that video. Um, we have tried to wrap our heads around everything Vanderbilt's doing in discovery biomedical science, and we've kind of partitioned it into personalized health, therapeutic discovery, and public health. And everything we're doing falls in some way, shape, or form into those three buckets, and in some cases, multiple buckets. But Sten is actually profiled on that video in the public health area. And one of the things he says is 
that a great university has great responsibility. And it rings very true um, because we've been given a great deal at Vanderbilt. And I think the next decade is less about seeing us grow in our rankings and seeing us amass larger and larger amounts of NIH funding than how is it that we're going to take what we've been given and achieve impact. There is no place, no entity in the medical center or the university that is more focused on giving back than the global health initiatives. So um, the, the reason the global health programs are so front and center in my mind is they illustrate in such a direct, tangible way how a university can reach out and help people and have immediate impact on the health and well-being of people, not just locally but around the world. Uh, before we get started, I want to recognize uh, a few people in the audience, in addition to Sten, who's had a transformative effect on glo global health on this campus. In fact, it, it's hard to imagine global health on this campus without what Sten has accomplished with his team. The other associate directors and faculty in the institute, many of you are here today, and I want to recognize your efforts and your energy in making global health what it is today at Vanderbilt. Also, there are individuals who make up the Community Planning Committee for the 2010 Tennessee Global Health Forum. I want to recognize your efforts and hard work. And finally, our keynote speaker, a co-founder of the One World Health Medicines and Medicines 360, um, someone that I overlapped with and in our years at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Avi Herskowitz is here with us today. And now I'll invite Jim Shore to the podium. Uh, to introduce him as our keynote speaker. Jim is clinical professor of management at Owen Graduate School of Business and is interested in areas uh, ranging from social enterprise, corporate responsibility, to entrepreneurship, environmental issues, and corporate philanthropy. Jim, thank you. So, good morning. And uh, welcome to the second annual Tennessee Global Health Forum. It's very good to have you all here and to see uh, a number of my students in the room as well, which is always fun. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say thanks and congratulations to the ter terrific team at the Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health. Um, and, con and congrats on seeing uh, it's been fun to see this come to fruition of all of your uh, hard work over the last several months. My name, again, is Jim Shore, and I teach at the Owen School of Management. Uh, my efforts at Owen are focused on the important social and environmental issues in business today, including corporate responsibility, environmental sustainability, and social entrepreneurship. Uh, at Owen today, we are working to integrate these key topics into both the curriculum and the culture of management education. Uh, my work to date has been in an area, most of my work to date has been in an area called social enterprise. Uh, in a nutshell, social enterprise involves the use of business models and market-based approaches to explicitly dealing with, the, with social issues. Uh, social enterprises fill the gap between traditional nonprofit and for-profit models where socially purposed organizations leverage the power of markets to provide solutions that are often more effective, more efficient, and more sustainable than traditional government and nonprofit approaches. Over the last 30 years, social enter enterprise has evolved to include models that are successfully addressing many of the world's biggest problems, uh, including health care, poverty, unemployment, and other social ills. Uh, Grameen Bank, a Bangladesh-based bank uh, established by Muhammad Yunus, a Vanderbilt alum, uh, to provide small loans to empower the poor uh, is perhaps today's most successful uh, example of a social enterprise to date. Since 1974, Grameen has made more than $8.7 billion in loans to 8 million impoverished borrowers and realized 97% repayment rates. Grameen has not taken a dollar of donor funding since 1998 
and in 2008 made a profit of $19 million, much of which was returned to its borrowers through, through a dividend. Gr most importantly, Grameen estimates that two-thirds of their borrowers have successfully transitioned uh, out of themselves out of extreme poverty. But as promising as Grameen is as an example of the potential of social enterprise, we are here today to talk about global health, not microfinance. Fortunately, there are some pretty remarkable and inspiring uh, examples of social enterprise in the global health arena as well. In Africa, Riders for Health is providing reliable access to transportation to health workers serving the rural poor. Last year, a team of MBA students from Thailand won a social enterprise business plan competition with a, for, with a plan to develop and commercialize a diagnostic kit for leptospirosis. And here in Nashville, the Dispensary of Hope is building a sustainable nonprofit business model to provide medications to the uninsured. All of these examples give me great optimism for the promise of social enterprise solutions to global health challenges. But perhaps the most inspiring social enterprise approach to a key global health issue today is with us, is with us here today. The Institute for One World Health was founded in 2000 as the world's first nonprofit pharmaceutical company dedicated to developing new, effective, and affordable drugs for neglected diseases throughout the world. Through an approach that leverages academic, corporate, government, and nonprofit resources, and in partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, One World Health is successfully developing a new model for drug development that aims to fulfill the promise of medicine for the developing world. Our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Avi Herskowitz, was the co-founder of and chief medical officer of One World Health through 2009, when he and his co-founder and wife, Dr. Victoria Hale, launched a new social enterprise, Medicines 360, where they are now focused on creating a sustainable model for developing affordable medical solutions that address women's health inequities. Dr. Herskowitz is also a clinical professor of medicine at UC San Francisco and a staff cardiologist at the San Francisco VA Med Center. His distinguished career has included 12 years at Johns Hopkins uh, and more than 100 published peer-reviewed articles and book chapters. Dr. Hale was originally scaled, scheduled to be with us this morning, and Dr. Herskowitz was kind enough to step in when she had an issue that prevented her from traveling this week. So Dr. Hale sends us not only her regrets, but also her partner in making this world a better place. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Avi Herskowitz to Nashville and to Vanderbilt. I want to thank everybody for coming this morning. I'm Olivia Manders, and while I'm getting Dr. Herskowitz's um, presentation going, I would like to ask that everybody set their cell phone to vibrate for us, if you would. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Um, I want to thank Sten first and uh, Jeffrey for their opening remarks. And for inviting me, uh, and for Jim, to work, who was working with Victoria and now I, preparing me. I also want to thank Olivia for her heroic efforts to getting me here last night, late in time. Um, Victoria does send her apologies. Uh, and. I'll try my best to, to do her talk justice. Uh, for, those of, uh, for those of you that know her, know that she's a very dynamic speaker, and, uh, but I can tell the story pretty well. Uh, you know, when you're a, a heavy traveler, sometimes you sort of arrive at an airport destination, you don't really quite know where you are. But yesterday, after a long day on the road, uh, I took the taxi, and the taxi driver was Somalian, and he was humming a Dolly Parton tune. So I knew I had arrived in Nashville. <laughs> the, um, 
the story and the spirit of this particular journey that I wrote about uh, starts with Victoria. And this title is not to say that ten year, a 10-year journey is a very long one. But in this setting, this last 10 years, I think, dictate and, um, and inform our thinking about what impact means, what sustainability means, what social enterprise means, what the concept of social entrepreneurialism really means. So this is such an important time. I'm framing it that way, although many of you in the audience probably have longer careers in global health than this time frame, and I don't want to belittle that. But let's focus on the last 10 years, which have probably been the most innovative 10 years in this sector, and let's uh, learn from each other. So again, the story starts... Uh, uh, for me and Victoria started when we met at Johns Hopkins after she had first become a pharmacist. That clearly wasn't enough. Uh, she then went to UCSF's graduate program in pharmaceutics and um, trained with uh, senior leaders there and then um, came back to Baltimore and Washington and became an FDA senior reviewer for Carl Peck. And a, a very serious uh, person uh, uh, dedicated to early drug development. Some of you may know him. And there she had two uh, seminal experiences. One was uh, a, a wide, wide exposure to drug development, both early and late drug development. Thousands of INDs, hundreds of NDAs over a very short period of time. And secondly, she joined a very influential group of women in the Women's Health Division at FDA that decided to analyze the question of whether there were enough women being enrolled in clinical trials at the time. The data showed that they were not. And then these women uh, together with the commissioner and the deputy commissioner uh, changed the uh, federal regulations on women in clinical trials and the requirements thereof. And she got a taste for the power of a few very dedicated people to make a difference. And that, that influence, I think, uh, is, uh, then became part of her everyday thinking. Um, she clearly wanted to get back to San Francisco as quickly as possible, though. So when an offer came into Genentech, uh, we and the family moved uh, there. And um, she had good years at what was then a very innovative a uh, biotech company that was doing serious drug development for serious diseases. I had then taken over a nonprofit research organization in, in the city uh, and learned how to manage a large nonprofit enterprise. Little didn't I know that that would be the, the way we would ultimately learn to work together over time. But in 98, um, um, after our second child was born, Victoria decided to take two years off and travel around the world and decide what she wanted to do. Because she had the adage that the, there are two most important days of your life. One is the day that you're born, and the other day is the day when you figure out why you were born. So I remember the, uh, the scientists, the intense scientists that work at Genentech at the time, they were all motivated by these type of proverbs given by the original founders of the major pharmaceutical companies. But in the late 90s, the pharmaceutical model was considered to be breaking up. Blockbuster opportunities were fewer and far between. There was a steady decline in the annual rate of new approved drugs uh, throughout the 90s, 80s and 90s. And it was clear that the output from all the R&D expenditures was becoming more and more difficult to identify. Inflexible systems, high overhead costs, a lot of money to bring a drug to market and so on, forced the industry to uh, focus on blockbuster opportunities alone. And then there was an obvious gap that uh, Médecins Sans Frontières used to uh, talk about throughout the 90s, uh, appropriately so, uh, the 1090 gap, 10% 10 of global health R&D is devoted to conditions that, uh, that occupy 90% of the global disease burden, and very few entities uh, had been approved. And the majority of those entities, I think 12 of the 13 of those entities, were approved for veterinary use. They were being used 
for human disease, but they were approved for veterinary use. So there was essentially no R&D going on at the time for diseases of the neglected populations. So why this concept of a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, and why would Victoria come up with the idea as basically a young uh, a drug developer who had uh, a few years under her belt at FDA and at uh, Genentech? And that was because it was needed, and no one else was going to do it. Uh, we went throughout the world and asked all of our colleagues, very senior people, do you want to do this? And they said, yeah, as long as you do it. Uh, as long as you run it, uh, we'll be able to join. But the concepts that uh, venture capital would not be uh, available for these diseases and concepts that you wouldn't be able to change your mission because you'd find a commercial application for the same technology that you were originally designed to, to meet for a social cause this was really the two elements that caught Victoria's eye initially, and of course no short-term returns to worry about, but really the, the social return on investment. And certainly the, 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 the burden of disease was staggering. And remember, in the late 90s, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation established itself as what would be then uh, was obviously to be a great leader in this area, yet they were focused on a certain, uh, they had certain biases. Firstly, they were going to prevent disease with vaccines predominantly. Then they would focus on the triad of HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, both on the vaccine side and to a certain extent on the drug side. And all the, a lot of these other diseases would, uh, would uh, fall away. And when you look at the largest drivers of, of uh, childhood deaths, they're diarrhea, uh, malaria, and neonatal causes, and pneumonia. So diarrhea, neonatal causes, and pneumonia would fall by the wayside, and there wouldn't be... Uh, a, a drug-related R&D effort in, that, in, in those fields. And the, the original business plan for One World Health was going to focus on childhood mortality. So the concept of a new path forward started to emerge over dinner conversations, over intensive conversations amongst colleagues in San Francisco, in Washington and FDA in particular, and uh, in Geneva and in India and so on uh, as she traveled around the world. And ultimately, the concept of creating a new business plan came up, a new business model as Jim raised, something that would be more of an enterprise rather than a, a classical charitable type of effort. And then, of course, it becomes a personal issue. Um, as she's framing this concept in her mind, she's experiencing things, and she's traveling around the world, as you all ha as many of you have. Uh, and she became a global citizen very rapidly, and get, uh, was clearly affected by the the, uh, the 10 million childhood deaths uh, from preventable diseases, and that was the problem. And the solution was that there could be safe, affordable, and effective solutions already available for neglected diseases, and they needed, to, to, they needed nurturing, they needed to blossom over to approved therapies, but that there was this concept of late-hanging ha late fruit, a uh, mature fruit that could be picked from the tree without a great deal of effort, without focusing on the discovery phase necessarily, uh, and, and use that as a proof of concept that this could work. Uh, and then be able to partner with industry uh, on the high, taking the high road, not being negative. It's obvious that the industry can only focus on profitable uh, ventures. It cannot do this alone, and we would do this in concert with a growing group of, of these partnerships that had been funded from the mid to, to late 90s. I think Victoria was most affected by this concept of the in invisible people 
having these invisible diseases. And that's uh, why, ultimately, you'll see in a moment uh, how we came to the first proof of concept idea, program, or project. And that is a really key issue. Uh, do not try, in your when you're first trying to start and found an organization, do not try the world's hardest project to get, uh, to, to take it all the way through. Uh, you have to be very, very strategic and, and choose a project that is workable and doable for the organization. So she met uh, Dr. Shyam Sundar here. Uh, Dr. Sundar's family uh, grew up in Bihar state in India. Bihar state is a state of India that is the poorest state in India. Roughly 100 million people live there uh, all, the great overwhelming majority live, uh, entire families live on less than one dollar a day. It is also ground central for a little known parasitic disease called visceral leishmaniasis. Although leishmaniasis um, is the second most deadly parasitic killer and it kills about three to four hundred thousand people a year, the majority of whom live in Bihar, um, it still doesn't get a lot of notoriety because it is not as well known, of course, as malaria. So here is Dr. Sundar caring for one of the villagers uh, that he frequents. Now, Dr. Shyam Sundar's mother survived visceral leishmaniasis as a child. So as the oldest son, um, he was given the responsibility of running a clinic uh, in Muzaffarpur, in the center of Bihar, in the center of the epidemic. He happens to be chairman of medicine and infectious diseases in the University of Varanasi, a nine-hour train ride away, and was offered at that time when we met him the Ministry of Health of the entire country of India, uh, but refused it because of his family and personal responsibilities to that particular clinic. So profound people out there working on diseases that, uh, uh, that affect invisible people stimulate and inspire and, uh, and give you hope that you, you will be able to do this uh, together with a very talented individual. So certainly looking at the VL patient population, um, over half of them are children. Uh, this is a uniformly fatal illness that uh, affects uh, some 300,000 uh, patients per year. It's, it's uh, uh, the disease is, uh, uh, is a function of a bite of a sand fly, and it is situated just in five countries. So the worldwide burden is in five countries. The majority of the worldwide burden is in one location the size of Wisconsin and India. Um, drugs can be curative. When they're curative, you develop uh, innate immunity, so it's a lifelong cure if you're able to, to get therapy. So the concept of being able to then go after the flies, go after uh, the patients who are already infected, you can imagine the concept over a 10-year, 20-year period of being able to eliminate this, this parasitic disease from the planet. And this was an idea that, that would, would make it more attractive for the funders in the future to tackle along with us. So here is the worldwide distribution. So from 98 to 2000, we wrote a strategic plan. I continued uh, working uh, uh, to, to pay the bills. And the, the entity was founded, One World Health was founded. And then it took an entire year to get the, the, our charity status because the IRS felt that we were more likely than not a front for the pharmaceutical industry or the lobbying industry for the pharmaceutical industry. So it took quite an exercise and quite a number of very high-powered law firms who were working pro bono for us to make this happen. Little did she know at the time that she was a social entrepreneur at that time. Now, Jim probably knew this term back in 1998, 2000, but I never had heard of it, and most of you had not have heard of it in those days, but now it's a common term. And these are individuals that don't give up uh, and want to remake the world for the better. And uh, I'd say that this uh, uh, very much describes the spirit of uh, all the staff at One World Health and the ability to attract and be a magnet to people who believe in this form of, 
let's say, justice or, or way of working. Now, in order to start a nonprofit pharmaceutical company, you need pharmaceutical scientists. And I was really skeptical that we could get them. Uh, the FDA colleagues of Victoria at the time were very, very supportive. They were consulting uh, post, uh, post uh, their full-time positions there. They were doing very well. They would help, but they would not come on full-time. So how could we uh, ultimately uh, attract uh, uh, the, the staff to do it? But the expertise was clearly available because companies don't own the expertise. The people that are in the project teams uh, own the expertise. Well, we had to have a compelling story, I think, and we also had to have funding. So right now we had our ideas, and then the, the example for the first program came with an old discontinued antibiotic called proamycin. This is an aminoglycoside, just like gentamicin, tobramycin, canamycin, that we all have been exposed to. And um, this was already tested by some investigators in Bihar and shown to be exquisitely sensitive to the Leishmaniasis parasite with uh, a greater than 90% cure rate. And uh, our goal was to uh, develop it through phase three trials and get it approved in India where it would be the first line therapy. And we would find a, a manuf an Indian manufacturer to manufacture it at cost and make sure that the cost was low enough that families even without governmental support, would not have to go into generational debt to uh, afford the therapy. So we wrote the first, the Gates Foundation uh, uh, and NIH funding grants in 2002 and got them approved in 2002. And one of the interesting stories that I could tell is in 2001, when Victoria first went up to Seattle to the Gates Foundation, and she pitched the idea of a nonprofit drug development company. They liked the idea, except they didn't like the word drug. They wanted her to substitute the word vaccine into it. And um, uh, she came back home and said, listen, Avi, they want us to write a $25 million award to, to start a vaccine development company. And of course, I told them no. <laughs> I said, I said, well, of course you did. I mean, that's a very logical thing to do. Why did you do that? Uh, he says, well, because it wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily a wise bet, she felt, to put all your eggs in the vaccine baskets. Why? Because the vaccine for malaria had not yet been developed, and 80, and 80 attempts had been attempted at that time. A vaccine to tuberculosis, a vaccine to HIV, these are all long-shot vaccines. They all deserve tremendous attention. But yet, 30 years later, you may still be developing a vaccine for these entities. So you needed to have a backup plan. The concept of the drug side of the Gates portfolio being a backup plan, though, came up later to be a very, very interesting challenge for us over time when we talk about sustainability. But they did fund us uh, uh, at we asked for $15 million to get this product through uh, to approval. They said they'd give us five, so then we asked for eight, and they, they decided to give us five. <laughs> uh, so we met, uh, we met fascinating individuals. Um, you know, Bihar state is the poorest state, but it's also one of the oldest states. In the northern part of Bihar, Buddha became enlightened. So there's two roads that are that are constantly maintained in Bihar. One is the one so-called superhighway, which I'll show you in just a minute. And the other one is the, the road between the airport and the site of Buddha Enlightenment. And that's where the Japanese government uh, paves the, repaves the road every season after the monsoon season so that its population can go visit. Uh, it also has one of the most, uh, the oldest universities in the world uh, uh, that was um, started in the year 900, and much of the intellectual capacity of India stems from Biharis, and yet again they represent in the government uh, the poorest population in the country. So Dr. John, the center here, is a uh, trained at Leeds University in Britain, as many of his colleagues do. They just happen to live in Mazafarpur, which is a town, a village of a million people where the tallest building is a two-story building. 
This is, the, uh, this is Dr. Jha's hospital after, uh, uh, Alan Dooley will note, that this is after we've re refurbished it completely. So, uh, but this is the, the, this is the appearance of it. So in 03, a year later, we begin our phase three trial in India, 670 person trial to show efficacy and safety. Um, and uh, results start coming in and they are uniformly positive. And then the concept of what early success would be comes up and the early success would be, hey, we showed that we could do something small but rational and important and we can get this drug, we can get this product through to approval to get it to the patients who need it. And that would be our successful paradigm to show you that we should get more funding. Yet, uh, just, just to cite, of course, a whole family of, of uh, a global village that's required the, the owners of the, of, the, of the drug package, the, 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 the prior NDA approvals, the WHO, MSF, that treats patients with VL in Africa, IDA and PPL, their manufacturing arm that manufactured the drug for us initially, the, fo the foundation's dollars, and then Gland Pharmaceuticals, um, which is an interesting family-run pharmaceutical company out of Hyderabad that took to the cause and decided to manufacture the drug at cost, with no profit, for the social benefit, something that we haven't quite got to in this country yet, but there are uh, elements in the developing world that are doing well, that are willing to give back. And then we, we, we had strong results. We, we got some press. This is a piece of Newsweek. We got New York Times to come to us to Bihar, and we got some attention, and we felt that that attention would uh, bring some uh, concrete uh, result, and it did. So we got some applause, but then the donors really didn't care. And this comes up to the concept of the concept of how neglected can you, how, how far down the tree of the neglected diseases can you go and still have support from, from the major donors? And the answer is that it's not limitless. The answer is that they're going to, in fact, more and more uh, focus up the tree and stick it out with HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis more likely than not, although other donors will come in and fill the gap. But that was not enough to be a sustainable uh, enterprise, even fully, even using the term loosely and say fully funded by charity, it still wouldn't have been sustainable at that time. So we decided um, that we would need to explore and expand to the larger diseases that were still gapped within the framework of the funding pool at that time back in the early 2000s. So when you look again, you have neonatal cause, you have pneumonia and diarrhea, which have the majority of the childhood deaths. We had written a strategic uh, landscape analysis for the Gates Foundation on uh, diarrhea vaccines, and, we'd, and we, we shared it with them and ultimately um, they are funding a series of vaccines, uh, vaccine enterprises in that area, but we decided that we would be best served to, to work on the drug side. And then, um, so let's start with that project quickly. So we traveled to Bangladesh, uh, it's a ground zero, I guess, for, uh, for cholera diseases. Uh, there's an institute that I'll show you in a minute that we partnered with and decided to focus on a dehydrating diarrheal disease, uh, which is a, a very large killer amongst young children. So we went to the ICDDRB in Dhaka, Bangladesh, which is an international uh, research uh, and clinical research uh, center there that is the world's largest diarrhea hospital and is the uh, hospital that came up with the oral rehydration solution back in the 1960s that has saved many, many millions of lives uh, throughout the decades. So this was uh, a Dr. Sachs, who was uh, a colleague of, of mine back at Hopkins, uh, who then was the director, and there's Victoria and I there. This is the, and during cholera season, uh, the hospital is overrun. They have multiple uh, tents uh, put up where they see approximately 1,000 new cholera patients a day. So 
the, the, the bad, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that they are the experts in cholera and dehydrating and diarrhea care, and, and they have a 99.99% survival rate if you can get your child to the hospital in time, which is a startling and magnificent uh, fact to, to recall, to remember. <clears throat> And Victoria had this idea that, uh, of, of, of disruptive technology. The concept is there are many, many, many different causes of diarrheal disease. If you targeted rotavirus, one of the main causes of, of diarrheal disease, and you created a vaccine for it, which is certainly a laudable goal and will uh, be de developed over the next decade or two, because uh, funding for it is now there, then you give it to all the children in the village. But then when they get cholera diarrhea, the moms say, what happened? You just gave me a vaccine. You said it would cure diarrheal disease, and now they have diarrhea. So this would be really a difficult problem for, for implementation in the developing world where educational levels are not high. And it would be difficult to explain. So could we find a technology that would uh, not be pathogen specific, but, but be, be pathophysiologically specific to the receptor that would be turned on by a number of pathogens that would then release a chloride and sodium loss and water loss, causing the dehydration. So there was quite a bit of cystic fibrosis research going on at the time, and the CFTR receptor is responsible for um, uh, uh, sodium and chloride um, ion channels uh, movement across cell membranes in a variety of tissues, including the gut. And of course, when this um, uh, is inhibited, when this is inhibited, you produce cystic fibrosis uh, 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 well, well, let's go into it. Let's go into it in a different way. Dr. Verkman was a UCSF colleague who was doing the work because he was primarily uh, funded to do cystic fibrosis research. And again, the applications of a CFTR inhibitor would be to create uh, uh, cystic fibrosis in human tissues and to generate animal models, but, but the same inhibitors would be useful to treat secretory diarrheas. And then we work, began working together with him and created the idea of a program that would ultimately lead to new therapies. So this is hard to see, but uh, I, I will uh, uh, not bore you with the science, but the, suffice it to say that the cholera toxin uh, uh, occupies and, uh, and activates the CFTR receptor and then the, basically opening the faucet. An inhibitor would close the faucet. You would still have cholera. You would still have a variety of other pathogens in your gut, but you would not lose as much water. So we were awarded a $46 million grant to get this work done because there isn't a single drug therapy for uh, childhood diarrhea in the world today. There are antibiotics, which are increasingly growing resistant to the, uh, to the various organisms, but there isn't a therapy. So we got this, and we developed a proprietary chemical set of leads. And this is the one time when we felt that going back to discovery made sense because, again, there was nothing here. And then we uh, created alliances with two of the large ten, top 10 pharmaceutical companies who gave us access to their entire corporate libraries. This was never been done before, of course, uh, because uh, they would never share their libraries, but, but very tightly uh, uh, managed uh, terms were, were reached to be able to allow us to access specifically for uh, leads that could impact on this uh, CFTR receptor. We also decided to tackle malaria as a, as a large disease process and, and tackle it from a different perspective. The, the artemisinin and combination therapies were effective. They were too expensive. The wholesale price from WHO was $2.40, but when you went down to the village level or to the street level, it was 10 times that much, so no one could afford it. So the concept was, the project goal was to establish and validate a new method of making the artemisinin drug, 
much less expensively because the, the majority of the cost uh, took place in the extraction from the plants. So the concept was is to use synthetic biology, essentially put the Artemisia plant genes into organisms, whether they be E. coli or yeast, and have them generate the drug for you. And the work was being done at Berkeley at the time for other reasons, for reasons of, of developing uh, biosynth uh, biosynthetic fuels. Uh, but we adapted the technology and formed a partnership with UC Berkeley to deal with the issue of price, to deal with the issue of volume. There would be an enormous volume requirement if you wanted to treat every patient available for malaria. Uh, and the plant way of harvesting it would never be able to meet that demand. The speed, if you had a slow season in harvest, you wouldn't be able to meet the demand the following year. And then the concept of if you control the supply, you could also control the, you could also control the way the supply was used and, in essence, not allow people to use monotherapy, not, not allow companies to develop monotherapy and use your product. And if you want to use our product, you'd have to use combination therapy so that resistance and counterfeiting would be minimized. So this concept of uh, 500 million cures came up per year where you'd have to have uh, two 50,000 liter bioreactors running uh, uh, continuously throughout the year in order to meet the demand. So through Berkeley and One World Health, uh, through the intellectual advancements at Berkeley and our uh, pharmaceutical development, expertise as well as our dollars, the Amherst Biotechnologies was formed. Now interestingly, I remember having the discussion up in Seattle saying, listen, we are investing in Amherst Biotechnologies. Can we take an equity stake in this and make this into a social enterprise where our dollars can work for us in the future and be used for future programs? And in those days, this is back in 0203, the answer was no, that that was too controversial uh, a concept for a large donor to, to allow an entity to seek profit from a for-profit venture and bring that profit back uh, for the social benefit. It was a li little bit too radical. It no longer is. I say that, and I'll bring that up later. But it no longer is. And then uh, well, let's not stick to the science. Let's stick to the, to the story today. And again, the disruptive technology was that if it could work, we could then find a large pharma partner to commercially scale it. Now, it happens to be years later, that partner ends up to be Sanofi Aventis. And it ends up that five years later, the technology has been shown to be, uh, uh, has shown proof of principle and proof of scale up, and now is being scaled to true commercial scale. And the target was 2010, so here we are. And sometime this year, uh, the, the, public, uh, uh, the public will get, uh, will, will understand where we are with this project. But uh, so far, all the commercial data coming from our large pharma partner are deeply encouraging. So the concept was to reduce artemisinin and cost by a factor of 10 and get it into the, into the realm of what chloroquine used to cost around 10, 20, 30 cents a dose. So we then went and we got our other two programs funded. And so now we had a substantial base. We actually could hire serious people who could t take their uh, leave of Genentech, Chiron, uh, um, a variety of other companies, and come to work with us with the anticipation that no matter what, they'd have funding for the next five years. And that's when the uh, the, the staff exploded in size and our capabilities exploded and we went up to about 120 people. So then the, the concept grew from a nonprofit organization can develop a new medicine to the fact that we could take high risk ex expensive biotechnology to reduce the cost of drugs and then we could take an approach that would focus on the patient, not on the pathogen. All this type of disruptive thinking uh, gave us a reputation and elicited other interest in the organization. And yet, 
at that time, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves, but we really came up with the next fallacy. The next fallacy is, is that you've developed a medicine, you've developed new technologies, you may develop a new medicine for diarrhea in the future, but how are you actually going to have any impact with any of these uh, uh, technologies? Because it doesn't guarantee anything unless you actually can get it to the patient. And we started thinking, holy crap, this is not going to be easy. Um, typically, the villages are one to five kilometers off the major roads. And like Stan, I have a favorite slide. This is the most impressive slide that I have in my deck. And this is the superhighway in Patna going throughout, from, uh, f throughout the, the, the major cities in the state of Bihar. And of course, the, the, the real element here is that the elephant is going in the opposite direction. So uh, this is the way it goes uh, in, in whether you're working in Africa. Uh, but here, at least, in this superhighway, uh, at least there, there's asphalt. So the asphalt will disappear in monsoon season, and then they will re rebuild this particular road. But this road has no lights at night, and is too, way too dangerous to, 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 uh, to tra traverse at night. So you have certain hours and so on. So how do you get your medicines to people who live at the village level, and in this case, who had to get 21 days' worth of injections? So the, the last uh, element of the, of the puzzle came when we um, were funded to do a demonstration of an access program, not only to, to approve the new drug, but to get it uh, out there in, in with partnership with the government of India into a disease elimination program. And so what we did is we had to uh, do phase four studies, which would demonstrate that you could give safely and effectively an injection to a villager for 21 days and make sure they got all their injections so that resistance to the organism would not develop over time, and you could do so in a safe and effective and affordable way. And then you can monitor and evaluate its, its impact. So we created a whole series of centers, uh, centers with satellite centers, and then satellite centers had workers go down to the village levels, and we demonstrated in the center and northern part of the state that this could be done. Then the question is, what did we leave behind um, uh, after this demonstration project? An issue of sustainability on the ground came up. And that is, we've left 35 full-time staff. The interesting thing about that is that this 35 full-time staff in Bihar, India, and Patna cost the equivalent of three FTEs in San Francisco. So it's about 10 to 1. And this is an important lesson just to keep in the back of your mind when you're dealing with your own budgets, the greatest driver of budgets for us in the United States are salaries. The greater drivers of, of budgets in the developing world are not salaries. They're not infrastructure. It's probably cost of supplies, something like that. It's something that's relatively trivial and uh, relatively speaking in the way we, where we have to budget things. We left 14 main clinical sites, and I'd, I'd love to speak to it with Alan Dooley later on. Uh, we upgraded four main hospitals, but we brought them up to good clinical practice standards. It took six years, but they can do an FDA-qualified trial today, and that will be ultimately their source of sustainability because they can expand to other diseases, they can expand to other clinical trials, and ultimately another entity, either a nonprofit entity or a for-profit entity, will be able to work with them at 10 cents on the dollar. They'd be able to make an impressive profit and be able to sustain their, themselves. We also left locally trained partners. The most successful group that we worked with in, in Bihar was a faith-based organization called Catholic Relief Services, who were a joy to work with, very, very skilled, uh, both in the, in the local population as well as in, in medicine and in health care. And then there was uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, um, who um, don't take the training very well, but they are uh, extremely uh, 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 dedicated people, as you know. And then the, both the national government, the Ministry of Health, and the state government officials were all trained in this demonstration access program uh, model. 
Um, and um, they did a lot of nodding and so on, and so we left it at that. But uh, what we really did was, was give them an opportunity to be successful, and this is the most important slide, and that is we worked with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to advocate for the World Bank to come in. Now, the World Bank decided to, to do a vector control uh, loan to the government of India, $250 million, and allocated $50 million to eliminate this disease from India. Uh, and they would be able to play for the vector control. Now, just understand that we're talking about spraying with DDT the size of Wisconsin. So that would require 10 to 20,000 uh, 10 to 20,000 workers, each with their sprayers, and they each would have to be uh, monitored and managed and so on. This is all doable financially, but it is, would be one of these massive social programs that would have to be done and that we could not do it. The government of India has to do that on their own. We left them with a 10-year supply agreement with Gland Pharmaceuticals to produce the drug at cost and they, had enough money, they would have enough money to pay the patients to get to the sites because that would be the main driver of them not coming. That They just simply can't afford the bus route. They can't afford not having uh, tilled their fields that day. So what defines success? And we'll get into the segment of the talk that, that Jim wants me to focus on. In terms of long-term impact, you need to have, think through sustainable business models, the so-called social enterprises that, that uh, we all are thinking through today. Now, what happened at One World Health? We were primarily philanthropy driven. We had difficulty diversifying funding because we had a very large funder. And the, the smaller funders came in and said, well, how can we compete with this funder? When they give 10x to our 1x, how are we going to actually get what we need out of this program and how could we control our dollars when, when you're getting 10x dollars from them? And that is an issue that you would all have to deal with once, even once you hit a jackpot and you get a large funder uh, that comes with a variety of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of systems and controls that you have to think through. And I'd be happy to talk about in the... Uh, and the discussion groups. And then the concept that you, the global economic impact would be limited to this funding pool is one that starts to really uh, gnaw at you and say that this is just not going to work uh, for the long-term solution. Because at that time, uh, in 06, we had programs for drug development programs for uh, intestinal worms, cystosomiasis, and Chagas disease, all ready to go, fully turnkey programs are ready to go, but no interest from funders. So programs that we would have executed had we had the dollars, but the funders were not executed. And then the, one of the main reasons that Victoria got into um, drug development for women in the developing world would be to create the new the, the new um, generation of medicines for malaria and pregnancy. And let me just see. Okay, it didn't come up. Sorry. Sorry. And this project was not funded either. And that sort of broke the camel's back and said, this is uh, probably not, we're not probably in alignment any longer and I need to move on to another model. Uh, and I was in complete agreement with this. Because we also not only had the drug development programs that weren't working, we realized that no matter what, there would be a, a limitless need from the patient side. And that unless you had control over the system and be able to make social enterprises work with you, and get the drugs to the patients and, and, and control that process and make it profitable for every step of the way for people to be engaged that it would not work in a classical model. You can't, FedEx does not come to the Congo, to Nigeria, to Kenya, to Bihar State. So the concept of a social enterprise or a revenue driven uh, social enterprise uh, leading to sustainability uh, was the next uh, step of evolution. And we started uh, um, meeting with groups in Haas and, and Stanford 
uh, and, uh, and competing in, in nonprofit uh, uh, competitions for business plans and so on. And then we were also affected by the local economy in San Francisco, and Steve Jobs' approach to this is, we feel, an important one, that um, it's not so much the dollars, it's how you use them, how you lead the people, and how much you really get it, uh, as he's played out with all the more recent uh, technologies that Apple has come up with. So. The concept when Victoria left One World Health in 1998, I was to leave about a year later when the new management was fully in place. But from 98 to 2000, she started working on version 2.0, which actually the first business plan for One World Health also included women's health, but then it, it, that came out uh, when we got the funding from the Gates Foundation initially. So. This then would emerge back again uh, to the, uh, one of her passionate uh, um, uh, areas. And to, to deal with innovative and affordable therapies for women and children. Uh, and then for the first time in our journey together, we had the word domestic come in. And Jim probably caught that right away uh, because he'll know wh how it's being used. But but the concept here is that we, uh, we would create a, a social enterprise that would use profits from revenues driven uh, by product development that sold in, in the West, sold in the commercial sector in domestic markets that could afford to pay, and that would then subsidize new programs and subsidize the, the, the products uh, um, that we would uh, be able to sell at cost to the public sector. But we also needed the people again. So we had met so many people throughout the years that said, I just would love to work with you, but I just can't do it because of my, my options have invested yet. Well, if you can imagine in 08, in terms of how many options were really vesting in the biotech industry, well, there were very, very few. And so many of them, about 25 of them, have already said, screw that, I'm, so, I'm tired of waiting. And then a lot of the original team and, and, and quite a number of new team members came forward to join the effort to start Medicines 360. So the concept of Medicines 360 is a continuum of care on the, for both for women and for children. And in phase one, we focus on, on the top part, the green part, uh, on the continuum of care for women and maternal health. Before pregnancy, during pregnancy, birth, postpartum, and uh, into the, ma the long-term maternal health concepts. And the concept is this. To begin with philanthropic funding for a social mission, develop a drug or a therapy that has global value, including in the developed world, in this case, the United States, Europe, the developed nations, Japan, Australia, Korea, and so on. And then have the domestic market sales sustainably support the same product in the public sector done at a much reduced price. And then new programs, such as if you wanted to do malaria in pregnancy, then this, this is what the entity makes a decision to do. And it can do it because it has the revenues to do it. Without going into the formal business plan of it, because that would take a, a whole hour, uh, the first program is the long-acting reversible contraceptive or IUD device for all women. This is the state-of-the-art levonorgestrel, which is a, a, low, a very low dose, locally active progestin, uh, releasing a drug into the uterus for five to seven years with essentially no uh, contraceptive side effects. Uh, exquisitely uh, effective and safe and very, very, very expensive. So there's a single product on the market today that sells for 600 US dollars to the commercial market. And it can be made at $25. So the idea is to sell it at $600 to the commercial sector and then use those revenues to then sell it to the public sector market at $25 and then have over time, if you're fortunate enough, and if it is a success, have enough funding to, to develop new programs. And I um, promised Victoria that I would stay until we initiated the first
phase three clinical trial. We got funding uh, all in the last year. Uh, we lined up a very, uh, what's called, what we call a LAD, a large anonymous donor, uh, that funded this uh, project, understands the model, supports it completely, understands the concept that they don't want to fund charities forever to do their, uh, to, to execute on their social mission, and that this is an experiment, understanding that they're rolling a very expensive set of dice, but that they wanted to, to, to see if this was doable. And it, says, and it should be imminently doable. We started the phase three trial uh, for approval in the United States and the EMEA for global approval throughout the world in December 2009. And in two and a half years, we will have finished this trial. And in three and a half years, we will be um, filing our NDA with the FDA. Now, you don't have to go far to understand that there's a domestic need on our as a nonprofit, that you don't have to go to the global, uh, to the global marketplace or to the global health matters. You can you can just look at it from the United States perspective because I wanted to make sure that I I don't only talk about global health because there's need within only a few miles of our homes throughout the United States, as you well know. And so that there is a public sector need in terms of contraception, and. One of the one of the most um, uh, compelling concepts is is that 50 percent of the pregnancies in the United States are unintended. So there is clearly a need for new development of new ways of strategies, new new therapies, and so on, to eliminate this type of um, issue and problem. And at the same time, there is a need to have. A, a, a structure w within which you can get um, products developed for all women throughout the world. And how do you do that? I think Victoria is probably the best suited person in the world to develop a women's brand, a company that will be dedicated and be known for women helping women. If you buy this product, whatever it may be, you are going to help a woman in the developing world be able to have access to that product or a woman a, a woman of poverty in your own nation. And I think that this concept is, is the concept that will be playing out over the next five or ten years. And these are the diseases that we wanted to work on at One World Health on the women's health side, which will never be dealt with by the industry. And these are diseases that cause uh, uh, the tremendous uh, uh, burden of of postpartum deaths, postpartum hemorrhage, eclampsia, obstructed labor, and then this devastating issue of having the poorest of the poor women working all day and night, and they're working with hemoglobins of seven. So this, you know, th this is a, a, tr a tragedy that needs to be affected and so on. So working on these issues is a dream for Victoria and I, and, and this hopefully will, ha will, will come out of this model, although we'll, the model will play out over the next few years. And as you know, as, you were, as Sten uh, told us before, uh, this is just part of the big picture, that, that uh, drugs and medicines are only part of the solution, and that's why you have such a diverse audience here, and you can't forget this, that um, you cannot, you need a community, you need uh, a community of, of very dedicated people to do this. We, we, we should not work in silos. We duplicate a lot of efforts when we work in silos. We, we much better work with teams. Project teams uh, working, whether it's, been, uh, whether it's project team working on the, on the Boeing 777 or the 787, that's how they get it done. They don't work in silos anymore and these very complicated uh, development processes. There are immense challenges, as you know. And then there's a journey. The journey is both difficult and, and very rewarding at the same time if you can get to the last line. Because they will ignore you, particularly the funders first. Then they'll laugh at you when you can get the funding. Uh, then they'll fight with you to get control of what you do with their funding. But then you win. Uh, because you still get your work done. Some important lessons as I close the, the talk. It's not what we do. What, while what we do is important, how we do it is more important because we have to do it with the utmost respect for our 
patient populations or our, our constituencies because ultimately this is a human endeavor. We're no better than anyone else is. We're here, we're more fortunate, but we're no better. The cleverness of, the, uh, of our colleagues throughout the developing world is immensely satisfying to witness and to learn from. And the way they do quality health care in these countries will, I believe, teach us how to, how to deliver quality health care in our society because uh, we clearly don't, don't um, have all the answers ourselves. Ask and listen more frequently. There's a lot of tea to be drinking, uh, to, to drink, because um, hundreds of teas. And, of course, take your Cipro uh, pro prophylactically because some of the tea hasn't been properly uh, boiled. But... Uh, there's a lot of empowerment of others to do more because obviously sustainability on the ground counts uh, in order for long-term impact to happen. Don't ever forget the smiles of the children because they are infectious and so wonderful. And, and then embrace the entrepreneurial culture. It's not how many times you've failed, it's uh, how many times you've tried and whether or not you're willing to fail and what you'll do next. And my, it's my sincerest wish that 10 years from now, we stand here, one of you stands here presenting your mission and give us the next 10 year journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. That was uh, a whole new frontier in the way of thinking about these issues and uh, that's why we were so pleased you were able to come and we wish your your wife well um, we, we're ahead of schedule have you ever been in a meeting where you're ahead of schedule uh, I don't think I have so that mic is in the center and I think this is a pretty special opportunity for some of you to get up to the mic I sometimes talk to folks in Middle Tennessee who are for example struggling to figure out funding for their overseas activity. Uh, um, I was talking to Jenna the other day and, and you know, it, it's just there's, there's a downtick in uh, private sector funding for NGOs uh, as a direct consequence of the uh, fiscal crisis. So here's an example of people with a vision who walk away with $45 million from the Gates Foundation and, and much more subsequently. Um, I think you can ask any question you like of Dr. Herskowitz, and I think he'd be very more than happy to uh, uh, respond. So anything on the st strategy side, the fundraising side, any questions you had about his uh, presentation, how they made the decisions they, 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 they would. So please, grab a mic and fire away. I might actually, I might actually fire away with one question, which is... Um, what is the current status of your visceral leishmaniasis initiative, the thing that sort of got you started? Right. So we have uh, the, the World Bank um, initiative going on, which is, has to be run by the government. Um, so they have drug available. They're purchasing drug. Um, they're distributing the drug. They're using our centers, but they're also using – they're trying to mobilize their own – public health uh, uh, infrastructure, which is not ideal, as it is, for example, routinely uh, with pre-earthquake in Haiti. It's not an ideal situation there. It's not ideal. Uh, thousands of patients are being treated, uh, but they haven't scaled it to the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands level. But in the meantime, we understand in order to eliminate the disease, you need to treat people in Bangladesh and Nepal on the Ganges Plain. So the, the three areas that need to be, and, and they, all, they all migrate quite a bit. So there are, there are initiatives, small studies going on in Bangladesh and Nepal for approvals there. So then they have then a triad of countries all working together. And um, the Biharis have to prove that they're able to do this. So this is, the goal is for, uh, by I think it's 2018, the first goal was 2012, then it's 2015. I believe more realistically, by, perhaps by the end of the decade, uh, to make uh, the vector control happen. That would bring the burden of disease down by a factor of 10, and then you could treat the patients accordingly. Right now, treating 300,000 patients, villagers primarily, these are the poorest of the poor, 
uh, is probably not going to be feasible uh, with the current infrastructure, but getting the vector control down so that less people get infected, uh, that would probably be workable. Great. Naji, for Avi's sake, tell, and the audience, tell, tell, tell us who you are and what you do and fire away with your question. Uh, I'm Naji Boomrad. I'm at Vanderbilt in the Department of Surgery, so uh, I'm here to learn. Congratulations. Uh, let me press you on your vision a little bit. Are you going to wait to be Bill Gates to make all your money from your developments dom domestically and then give the money, or will you press ahead and start helping people to think out of the box like you and your wife and others have done and develop mushroom into new entities? Uh, well, I'll answer that in a few different ways. Well, I left Medicines 360 as soon as the clinical trial started <clears throat> because I want to uh, replicate this type of concept for the chronic disease burdens that are now affecting the whole globe, which will be focused, my amount area will be cardiovascular disease. So yes, uh, I, I'm interested in duplicating and replicating and doing it exponentially over time once a core group of uh, people um, uh, are successful at it. Um, we have to, um, so when we first started One World Health, um, when we started to get uh, some notoriety, Victoria spends, spent about half of her time um, not running the company but teaching others to do it. So we had, I think, four, we, we have the record of helping about 20 entities form uh, around the world. Uh, entities that needed some advice, had great ideas like Architects for Humanity, uh, Writers for Health to be able to expand past Africa. Uh, others uh, were coming, uh, uh, groups that would be doing nonprofit drug development and oncology. Uh, for rare oncological diseases. Uh, we had a particular interest in one of my closest friend's sons, uh, daughters, excuse me, develop Ewing sarcoma. We tried to develop a one-off therapy for her back in 1997, uh, failed but demonstrated to the community uh, that it could be done and uh, spawned some interest on that level that rare diseases and orphan diseases could become profitable and sustainable even in a social enterprise system. So we, we've we been working with Faster Cures, uh, the, uh, a group that's dedicated to finding ways to get, you know, faster. And yet, that's not all there is. There isn't, you know, drug development isn't all there is. Uh, there are, as you know, surgeons going throughout the developing world doing amazing work. The, 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 the cleft palate surgeons, the, 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 the plastic surgeons, the ophthalmic surgeons, um, the uh, orthopedic surgeons, the dentist, the dental surgeon going throughout the world, uh, banding together, doing amazing good works, and actually creating paradigms for sustainable uh, treatment of all patients. Again, when you do the, I think it's called the Aravind uh, Eye Center, which is the premier eye, cl eye ophthalmic clinic probably in the world that, that treats more patients, uh, prevents more blindness than any other center in the world, has a, uh, uh, has a, uh, a pay system, a, a staggered pay system where the people, the, the, the best and, uh, and richest people of India go there because it's, it has the lowest uh, adverse outcome rates, but they pay for the, for the um, poorest of the poor to get their therapies for free. So these systems are evolving now, and I hope to, to dedicate a good deal of my time to helping others uh, get started. Yes, I think that this is the pivotal time in history to do this type of work. Because, uh, uh, as you said, the, the industry is, uh, industries in general are providing less. They're providing also less in a certain way that 
in, the, in essence, they're providing less for things that are not in their local communities because, again, there's less secondary benefit to the entities when they do that. So when you, the, more, the, further, the further away you go, the less enticing you are to a, a local entity that may be situated directly and may have their uh, international headquarters in Nashville but then may not have an interest in doing a project in Nigeria. Hi, Carol Etherington. I'm with the Institute. And I just wonder if you'd speak a little bit about coordination or what your experiences have been trying to coordinate or being a part of a coordinating body to get these different groups to work together for similar goals, even if they have different right. missions. What, what are your experiences about the coordination piece? Right. Well, there, there, are two, there, are two group, there are two types of groups that two categories of groups that you need to deal with. One is the, ca the groups that you must deal with. So that, for example, everyone knows that if you're doing a project in the developing world, you must work with the WHO. That has to be managed very tightly because they are not a fast-moving organization. They are not in alignment necessarily with, <clears throat> with you or with the way you, you particularly see your, the solution to the problem. And in fact, once they understand what you're trying to do, they'll understand that one of the reasons you're doing it is because they may not have been able to do it. And then it gets sensitive. So there are groups that you have to manage, and then there are groups that will actually help you. And these are the groups that you'll work with in a very fluid way. Now, working with groups in Europe, um, uh, Nashville, San Francisco, Asia, and so on are difficult to coordinate, as you know, and they require a great deal of management time and a lot more time than you had ever anticipated before. Um, and while communications, uh, communication tools are now here and now able to accomplish this, it rarely uh, is able to uh, bridge uh, communications gaps and language gaps and language barriers. You really need, you will need to make efforts to get together periodically on a very active program and then have very, very strong leadership on the ground. Um, so you can manage just so much out of Nashville. If you have a project in Nigeria, you need to have the right program director there. Otherwise, you will more likely than not fail. Uh, I don't know if I quite answered all the points there, but those are just a few of the ideas that come immediately to mind. 